Good evening and welcome to Face to Face, the show where we talk with local radio and television broadcasters here in South Dakota. We've had quite a few guests here on Face to Face. We've talked to news anchors, radio personalities, and even a sports director. But we haven't talked to someone whose job is important to pretty much everyone here in South Dakota, the weatherman. That is, until today. Today I'm joined with Chief Meteorologist at Kello TV, Jay Trobeck. Jay, thanks for being here today. Well, thanks for inviting me, Avi. Can you please give a uh, brief bi biography of yourself to uh, the viewers at home? Hmm. Well, I, uh, I grew up in uh, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and started in television uh, about 20 years ago, actually. Found my way to Sioux Falls about 1985, and I've been at Kello TV ever since. Wow. What, um, what interested you uh, to go into television broadcasting? Uh, hmm. like, it's like in your younger years? Right. Uh, I, uh, I guess I, I'm actually kind of an accident that I ended up in television. Actually, really? it was, it was not, not anything that was even remotely on my mind, uh, even back uh, several years. When I was in high school, I was in speech, the debate and, uh, and declamation, you know, giving, giving speeches and things like that. And, uh, and I really thought throughout the early part of my, my early adulthood, I thought I was going to be a professional soccer referee for the rest of my life because that's where my that's where my whole career and everything was headed. And uh, I did referee some professional soccer games, and I really? coached soccer at the college level. And I really thought that that's what where I was going to end up. And uh, um, lo and behold, I. Uh, uh, through kind of an accident, a, a friend of mine ended up in broadcasting school, and I followed him, and uh, so I ended up in television. It was it was not anything that I had even remotely in the back of my mind at the time. So it was just kind of just a fluke that you went into this. Did you try anything else beforehand in high school or even before then? Uh, I had done quite a quite a few things in in high school, and uh, even in college, uh, I worked uh, uh, I worked at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, and uh, I did some some voiceovers, some industrial films, that sort of thing, just to uh, get a few dollars. And that's the sort of thing where you go and you do a commercials, or if somebody might see a, uh, some kind of a product demonstration film or something like that, I'd go and I would I would be in those. And but that was about the the extent of it. Other than um, I also did. Uh, uh, it was kind of interesting. I, for young children, they have books on tape where children learn to read by they get the book and then they, they listen to the tape. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was kind of interesting because I, I did some of that too. Uh, and uh, in fact, my, my youngest sister actually, when she was in school, uh, brought home one of these tapes one day, and it, it was me reading the book that she was supposed oh to have for, for class. But uh, so I had always been involved in different communication and things like that. But uh, as I say, I was probably more more thinking I was going to do something in, in soccer uh, as a, a, a coach, mm -hmm. or uh, as I say, I was al already refereeing. So, what what were your interests in the soccer field? Why did you was it your favorite sport? Uh, it was. I was in the first group in Minnesota when Minnesota finally got soccer in the high schools. I was one of the first groups. Um, and then in my senior year, very early in the season, I got my ankle broken real badly mm. um, to the point where they, they put a screw back in and things like that. So that pretty oh much my. ended my playing career. So after that, I was pretty much just uh, refereeing. And, uh, and that, was, that was what mm. I thought my career was going to be. Uh, um, but uh, uh, that came to a quick end right there. What do they teach you in college for broadcasting? Um, mostly what, what, what I learned in college, um, I, I took a class very, very much similar to the classes you take uh, here in high school, but I, I took classes like that in college, and uh, I must say I didn't do very well in them, oh my. <laughs> strangely enough. Uh, my grades weren't particularly well, but what I learned most in college, I went to St. John's University in Minnesota, and what I learned most of all was uh, how to communicate and how to think. And really, that's the most important thing, I think, when you're in the communications business, when you're in television, or specifically in television news. It's really you have to know a lot of things about a lot of things. In other words, you don't have to really be an expert in any one thing, but you really have to know about a lot of different things. And in college, uh, I worked for the school newspaper. Uh, and Doing that, I got to interview some very interesting people. I, I interviewed F. Lee Bailey and William F. Buckley and John Kenneth Galbraith and uh, John Anderson, who was a third party candidate for president. And I got to do some really, really interesting things. Meeting and talking with them, uh, kind of like you and I are right now, but um, talking about little things. Uh, uh, 
uh, not necessarily, you know, if, 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 when you're in college and you're interviewing somebody like William F. Buckley, if you want to talk about, you know, his philosophies, his conservative theories, I mean, he's going to lose you. But, you know, you talk to people like that about uh, baseball or, or things like that, and you really get an of idea. general interest. Uh, yeah, and, but you learn so much because you find out that these people, too, they know a lot about a lot of different things. I mean, some of their hobbies, it's amazing what they are. F. Lee Bailey, uh, his true love was flying. You know, if I talk to him about legal concepts and things like that, uh, you know, it's way over my head. But I sit and I talk to him about aviation, and you know, here he had a helicopter factory, and, and he flew his own airplane and things like that. And it was really very interesting. You get, you get the sense that all these people who are really great people uh, really know a lot about a, a lot of stuff. And I think that, that that kind of was a clue to me to try and learn as much about a number of different things as I could. What did you do right after college? Where did you go? Right after college, I, uh, I coached soccer for a while. And as I say, I thought that that's, that was going to be my vocation. And uh, uh, then a strange thing happened. Um, your student loans become due. And that's a <laughs> really sad thing for anybody who just gets out of college. All of a sudden, a few months later, they realize that they've got to, that uh, your student loans. You, you, you owe money to quite uh, Yeah, you've got to pay money. So uh, just on about the last day before I had to make a check, and I, I didn't have the money, uh, a friend of mine enrolled in broadcasting school because he was in the exact same predicament I was. So he went and he enrolled in broadcasting school. I said, great, that'll get me out of my student loans, too. Give me some time. And so I went and I enrolled in broadcasting school, Where exactly at? At uh, Brown Institute in Minneapolis. Oh. And uh, so we went there, and we both graduated. And now we're both working in television. So I guess it worked out. What, uh, w was there anything different at Brown that you learned that you hadn't learned in first in college? Oh, absolutely. Um, things like uh, uh, timing are, is very important. And the way that, the way that you write uh, television news and the way that you, 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 you speak is, is much different than, than, say, you learn in college. Most of the time in college, um, or at least this is the way it, you, it used to be, and I, I don't think it's the case anymore because I think a lot of times that they've gotten more specific about writing for broadcasting. but. Um, when I was in college, a lot of times that the news writing was mainly writing for print, writing for newspaper. And the way you write for newspaper is very much different than the way you write for television. So, so that's one of the things I learned. And, and most, mostly, you know, the behind the scenes, how things work, how, how the floor directors work and tell the camera people what to do, and the audio person has to take cues, and the director has to decide what camera to punch. And that's the sort of thing that I learned. But um, it, was, it was a great experience because uh, uh, the other thing you learn is how to be down to the second on things, timing. You know, if, you, if you've got 10 seconds in broadcasting, if they say you've got 10 seconds, you can't have 11. You know, the camera goes to black or they go to commercial, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So uh, timing is another really important thing you learn. But uh, it, was, it was a great experience for me. Where'd you, were you hired right out of Brown? Or? <laughs> well, this is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, a friend of mine who, uh, uh, in broadcasting school, uh, we finished up and, and we were both... Uh, Oh, we had a difficult time. It, it, it's really? the hardest thing to do is get the first job in television. It's, it's always the very the hardest thing. And this friend of mine and I, we would meet at this at this uh, at this uh, little eating place, um, and we met there about once a week after school. And we're like, we're thinking, nobody is ever going to hire us. Nobody <laughs> is ever going to hire us. So. Uh, one day I get a job interview up, uh, up in Duluth, and I went up to Duluth, and uh, uh, I was in there, and the, the, uh, we went through the, did an audition. Um, the anchor at the time was a woman who was on HGTV, and her husband was a news director, and he's now a corporate news director somewhere. Um, but uh, anyway, the, so things went okay, and then he brought me back into his office. He says, now it's time to talk about money. He says, well, we don't pay very much here. And I said, well, you know, I didn't think you probably did. Uh, you know, my first job and all. And he says, um, the, the job pays $600 a month. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, now, and this was back in 1981, but still, I'm thinking, let's see, $600 a month. I think my student loans, I think the payment's like 400 a month. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, wow. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't think I, can, I don't think I can afford that. I don't think I can live on 150 a week. And he said, no, 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 not 150 a week, $600 a month. Because if you do the math, you realize that $600 a month is less than 150 a week because it's yeah. 52 weeks in a year. But, but anyway, so, so I went back to the Twin Cities and I was heartbroken. And my friend, uh, 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 he got 
the call, and they, he went up and interviewed for the same job. And he had a little bit more money than I did, so he said, I'm just going to do it because he was so frustrated at not being able to get his first job. And so finally, uh, so he takes the job, and uh, it, was, it was really very interesting because he finally got his job. Then a week later, I got my first job, and my first job paid about twice as much money oh, as he wow. was getting paid. But it's really kind of interesting because the two of us now, I've been in television for 20 years, and uh, Rob, that was his first job, and he is now a correspondent on Dateline NBC. Really? Yeah. So just if you think it happened, here's a guy who is clearly one of the best in the country at what he does. And I mean, he and I, we were both, I mean, it was to the point where we were both thinking that nobody was ever going to hire either one of us. What, uh, what station did you work for in Minneapolis? I did. I worked, uh, what I did, my first job was up in, uh, I worked for the KFIRE stations up in, uh, up in uh, North Dakota, uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. They are, uh, they're, they're really kind of the, the Kello TV of North Dakota, um, mm. KFWAR, a very good operation, very good outfit. And uh, I got my job as a sportscaster. That was really? my first job. So, what, what, what was that like? It was uh, different. It was, it was r very interesting. I, I really just loved it because uh, uh, I got to go and um, I, I got to go and cover the Twins occasionally, or the Vikings, or uh, the then Minnesota North Stars for ice hockey. I covered the colleges, got to do some play-by-play, -play, do the state tournaments. It was, it was great. I, I just I loved it. How long were you in sports? Um, I was in sports for about uh, three years. And then, then where did you move? Did you move? Then I moved from there down to here, uh, to Sioux Falls. I came to uh, Kello in 1985. And did you start in news or did you start in weather? I started in news. I was in news for quite a long time. Um, I always kind of hoped, uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a running joke between my, bo my boss and news director, Mark Millage, and I. Both of us, the job we really wanted at Keller was to be the sports guy. Neither one of us <laughs> ever got to be the sports guy. So Mark became the news director and I became the weather guy eventually. But, uh, what was news, what was working in the news department uh, back in the 80s like? Because you were working with uh, Steve Hemmingson, Steve working Hemmingson? with D Doug Lund. Mm -hmm. You were working with some pretty big guns at the time. Oh, absolutely. We learned so much from those guys. They're both, uh, you know, both those guys are, are pros. And uh, just about everybody who's come through Kello, Steve has, has grabbed, taught, molded, beat upon whatever it takes and, uh, and uh, uh, formed them in the way that, uh, you know, Kello's got a good reputation because of people like Steve and Doug and some of the guys who've been there for a number of years. So. Um, uh, they, uh, um, what it was a great time to be what there. What are some of the lessons <coughs> that they taught you? Um, Steve was, uh, I can think of many of them. Um, <laughs> uh, Steve has a particular way of writing that's the Kello style of writing that um, uh, pretty much everybody follows. Uh, um, very present tense, very what's happening now. Uh, Steve is very much uh, one thing he does to an extreme is, and, and, he, and he did very well is he can take a very difficult concept uh, like uh, taxation rates or something like that and he can write just the right metaphor was it to reduce a complex problem to simple language and that's something that he really ingrained on us was that uh, we weren't talking to people who who necessarily knew the background of any story we did but we nevertheless had to explain it and then Steve would write little things in, you know it, it, it's kind of like this, uh, but he could take tremendously difficult problems and reduce them to a very simple thing so that everybody could understand what's going on. What sort of, uh, what was the day like when you were a reporter? The, when I was, a, uh, the, the, the day was never alike two, night, two days in a row, and I think that that's still a case because the news doesn't matter whether, you know, you got up early or you want to sleep in or you stayed up late the night before. Um, news happens all the time and sometimes you work an eight-hour day and sometimes you work a 12-hour day and and occasionally we did have to work a 24-hour day uh, I remember that happening a few times where um, where you were just so dog tired that you could you could hardly uh, talk but but that's what you had to do how how long were you uh, in the news department before you went to weather? oh um, oh probably about 10 years Ten years. Did um, you decide to make the switch, or <laughs> well, it was it was kind of a, a power that be decision. Well, my my boss had, had always suggested I do it. And I never wanted to be quote just 
a weather guy. I never wanted to be just a weather guy because um, I, I thought there were more important things to do in the world than be just a weather guy. Mm -hmm. But um, what happened was, was our new general manager came in and um, he decided to get the absolute best weather equipment that was available to spend a lot of money and it, suddenly it became very important. Um, I, I think when when I started in weather at Kello, I think we had we had one computer, one monitor, and one television monitor, and that was our weather department. And oh, now wow. I think we have, I think it's uh, 15, 16 computers. Wow! And you know we've got a few more coming in a few weeks. Uh, we got three more coming. You don't even have a place to put them all. But just to show you, that, I mean, the technology has changed and the whole way th the way things were because. Um, I'd been talked to even by other stations about being a weather guy, and I never wanted to be just a weather guy. But uh, um, now it's it's very definitely a full-time occupation and beyond. What's one of the big differences between <coughs> weather and uh, doing uh, sports or news? You know, in in a lot of ways, they're all very similar. I mean, really? in my opinion, and 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 this is. I, th I think maybe we do weather maybe a little bit differently at Keller than a lot of places because I, I talk to a lot of my colleagues all over the country. And one thing that, that we always do in Kello, it, it, we really think that the weather is no different than telling a news story. It is no different at all. You've got, you've got a lead and you've got a middle of your story and you've got a conclusion and it's really no different um, in weather. The only thing is, is you're telling the news before it happens. That's why we always say, you know, uh, you know, we'll tell the weather, and then after it happens, the news department gets to handle it because it's history. That's a little weatherman's joke, you know, because what we do is still things yet to come, whereas the weather department, that's ah, already happened. They don't have to. So it, it's a little more difficult for us. We always say, you know, if we blow a forecast, we go and we tell the news department, okay, you tell us what's going to happen at the meeting next week all the time, and, you know, we'll, we'll call it good. But uh, um, so that's, that's our job. It is very... It is news plus science, really, is, is how it works. This sort of qualifies, <coughs> uh, actually, I don't know if this qualifies more as news or as weather, but one of, the, one of your more interesting moments on camera was in 1993, covering a severe storm in this area. Was it <laughs> up in, in Minnesota? Oh, uh, yeah. It was, uh, uh, was Chandler. The Chandler, you, like Wilson Tornado. It was, it was kind of an interesting day because uh, by then, I had already uh, tinkered in weather. Um, to some extent, um, and I, I think I already had my NWA seal at that time, but uh, at any rate, I, I was sitting working on that day. It was an election day in um, Sioux Falls, and I think maybe maybe South Dakota is primary day, um, but uh, yeah, I think it was primary day. I was supposed to co-anchor the uh, news coverage that night of the election with Steve Hemmings, and I'm sitting at my desk, and uh, and I'm looking up at the radar, and I see uh, two big storm cells making their way, one coming up from the south uh, west and one coming up from, coming straight across South Dakota from the east. And uh, about that time I got a phone call from our, uh, our engineer, Dwight Woman, and I can just hear the hail battering his vehicle. And he was up, I think, somewhere by Huron. Um, wow. And I can hear the windows being broken out. There's huge hail hitting it. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there and uh, I finished talking to Dwight and uh, I, uh, I got up and I went up to the desk and I, I said to uh, the assignment editor at the time, Joan Russell, I said, look, I said, I think something's going to happen here because these two cells were headed on a collision course and uh, the, it was already bad. I said, I think something ha might happen up by Brookings. So I said, can I take a photographer, we'll go up to Brookings, if what I think is going to happen, it'll be a bigger story than the election, and if I'm wrong, We'll turn around and we'll still be back about five minutes before the polls close. And Joan said, fine, go ahead and do it. So uh, Darwin Siebenhaler and I raced up to Brookings and we're just looking off in the sky and we see it and it passed by the city of Brookings and nothing had happened. And uh, we said, <coughs> excuse me, we said, okay, it missed Brookings. And just then we hear on the civil defense radio, uh, a woman comes on, she says, this is the town of Lake Wilson. Um, send everything you've got we've been flattened by a tornado and of course that's wow. straight east of Brookings what we were seeing was that actually it didn't happen in Brookings it happened just east of Brookings so we took off into Minnesota got to the town of Lake Wilson it was destroyed um, we were right on its heels and um, and then uh, of course while we were there 
uh, all kinds of things happened. Um, there were uh, people thrown from a car, a baby was trapped in the mud underneath the car, and then uh, people are saying to us, it's even worse over in Chandler, and we were the first people there, and that's kind of... you were like there right when the storm was, was going on. Yeah, we were right... Uh, yeah, what, what happened was, was, when we got to Chandler, we did... Um, we put together a package, and uh, um, it was very dark, and a second wave came through, and there was another tornado, which we were watching, as a matter of fact, while we were there. And, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the town actually, the people were sifting through the rubble of the F5 tornado, and the sheriff came out and said, there's another tornado coming, and they evacuated the town. And they said, you guys have to go, because we can't leave you here. And one of the sheriff's deputies said, okay, it's all right. We'll stay with them. We'll, we'll let them do it. And uh, unfortunately, there was a, uh, um, a couple of crews from Minneapolis, and the other sheriff had ordered them to get to a shelter because of this tornado. Oh. And so they were down in a shelter. And we were standing there, and we were the only people on the air. And what happened was, was another tornado came across. There was lightning crackling behind us. Our satellite truck is waving, and uh, we were doing uh, the live shot. And... Uh, it was a live shot was picked up, uh, it was aired on not only at Kello, but our live pictures were picked up by one of the Twin Cities stations, and, uh, and uh, uh, the pictures got out, and CBS had them, and we did, uh, the, um, it was just a, a miserable night for us because it was raining, there was no shelter, our satellite truck was almost blown you, up by the winds, there was crackling lightning, and... You were sacrificing <coughs> yourself for well, the weather for the... For we, we, were, we were really worried about it, Avi, because the... Uh, um, we were the highest point. Now, the entire town has been flattened. And what you don't want to be is the highest point around. And our satellite truck was definitely the highest point around. Mm -hmm. And there's lightning crackling. And I, I, I remember almost ducking, thinking that at any moment I was going to get zapped by lightning. Um, but uh, I, I think it made for pretty good TV. At least that's what everybody told us after the fact. It didn't feel real good at the time because uh, um, we were soaked. We, we wouldn't even have been on the air except that uh, a guy called from uh, CBS and called our cell phone and said, get on the air, we need those pictures. And so that's why we were on the uh -huh. air, because to tell you the truth, we're, um, we're extremely lucky uh, that we weren't hit by lightning or, or worse, hit by the uh, next tornado that came through. On the lighter side, <laughs> I have to ask, <laughs> what's been one of your more embarrassing moments on, on camera? Oh, there are so many. There are so many. Um, actually, uh, uh, maybe my, my best known embarrassing moment may have come from um, when I was a sportscaster. Uh, I, I was twice on. There used to be a program called TV Bloopers and Practical Jokes. It was hosted by Dick Clark, and, and Ed McMahon was on it. And uh, I was actually on it twice. Um, <laughs> one time, one time it, it was when, um, it was when I, I, I was a sportscaster, and uh, the, the floor director, you, it, it, this, you know, this is days before I had the digital clock like we do now. but floor director give you your cue, you know, three, two, one, and, and I had this network thing that I had to hit. Um, in other words, I had to carry, take, keep talking until we got down to zero, because there was no program, no anything mm -hmm. that went in between. So I'm getting down, and he gives me, you know, this, he's giving, you know, just a few seconds left, then he does this, you know, wrap it up. So I finished talking, and I've just said everything I know to say. And then all of a sudden I see the, him go like this, and he had, the timing was wrong. So I actually had one minute left, so he's like this. He's like, stretch, stretch, stretch. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm thinking, um, and I'm trying to remember all the wire copy I read that day. And off the top of my head, I'm saying, uh, and so-and-so uh, uh, -so, uh, announced his retirement today. And, and I'm doing stuff off the top of his head. And the last thing I had to say was, uh, and uh, the New York Jets had a new, uh, named a new head coach today. Um, uh, he was their defensive coach. Uh, and I couldn't remember the guy's name. Oh. I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there, and I just I, I couldn't remember it. And at this point, my the news anchor is just she sees exactly what's happening. She sees the sweat pouring down my face, oh. and she says, "What? Uh, what was his name?" <laughs> and I, and so I, I'm, I'm and I'm still trying to think of it. I couldn't remember the guy's oh, name. Oh my! Me. And she's just egging me on. And and finally, I said, "You know." We'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> that was it. So, but but it was really kind of funny because the uh, um, a couple of months later, my general manager called me into my his office and he put a piece of paper across and he handed me a pen. And he says he says sign this, 
And I said, what is it? He says, well, it's a release for NBC to use that blooper of yours <laughs> on the TV show. I said, forget it. I'm not going to embarrass myself on national television. And he said, well, they pay you 250 bucks. I went, <laughs> sign right that away. Was it. That was big money back then. Well, we have only a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, You've been a meteorologist for a while, and mm -hmm. you've been chief meteorologist since 97. Mm -hmm. You've written a book about the weather. Mm -hmm. We've just got, you know, you've had live Doppler for mm -hmm. a while now. Mm -hmm. What's been one of the big changes here in South Dakota about the weather that you've seen? Oh, uh, I think... I guess not just in, tech, in technology-wise, but... Yeah, uh, the, the technology certainly, but I, I think what's interesting is that um, a lot of these things used to happen in, in weather, and people didn't find out about them. Now... If you take a look at things, um, if something happens, we'll get a phone call about it. If, if somebody starts getting golf ball size hail, we'll get a phone call about it. In the old days, you know, you didn't usually find out about it. Maybe you heard, read it in the newspaper or something like that. We'll get a phone call about it. Another thing is, um, you know, like last year, a tornado came through Madison. Gentleman sent us over the internet uh, a home video clip of it. And so we had the home video clip of the tornado on the air long before our crew could even get up there to Madison. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that tells you what, I mean, there's a dramatic sharing of information. There are weather sensors everywhere. We have weather sensors in the very schools around the area. We've got sky cams now to take pictures of the big clouds that come across the prairie. Is um, weather almost, <coughs> is it pretty much more important than news and sports here in this area? Oh, I, I think it's very important. It, it all depends on your perspective. If you're a coach of a, of a local sports team, I think they would say that they're most important. But certainly what the weather is touches mm -hmm. everybody, and everybody is affected by it. And everybody's interested in not only the forecast, but I think we have just a kind of a pride at how rough the weather can get up here. You know, we're real proud of it. When, you know, what's the first thing when, when a relative calls from down south, calls up to somebody in South Dakota, what's the first thing that somebody up here tells them? Yeah, last week we had a wind chill minus 53. You know, we're always so proud of that sort of thing, and uh, and uh, I, 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 that's why I think weather is so very important up here. Quick question: uh -huh. What do you want to do before you retire? Oh man, I don't know. I don't know. You want to stay that's here in, good in, in Sioux Falls? You know, I thought I was going to be in Sioux Falls about one year, and I've been here 15 years now. No, 16 years, something like that. Um, my job is very interesting every day. I don't know. Uh, uh, about the time I think that ev I've seen everything, something else happens and it all gets exciting and interesting again. Wow. Well, Jay, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome, Avi. And I thank you at home for watching us, too. I'm Avi Forstein, and I hope you tune in for our next edition of Face to Face. From everyone here at Owl TV, good night. <laughs>